Um, my name is Dr. Jessica Collins, and I am a member here of the uh, Mercer Buffs Orthopedics team. I am a podiatrist and a foot and ankle surgeon. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a topic that um, is, is something I see very often, and that's heel pain. Uh, the, the title of my lecture here is a little play on words, healing heels, and I'm going to talk to you today about diagnosing and treating common heel conditions. And uh, really today, the focus of my lecture is going to be on um, the adult patient, um, but if there are any questions about um, any pediatrics, any um, questions pertaining to children, I'd be happy to answer that for everybody at the end of the lecture here. So I'm um, just start, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background here. Um, heel pain, like I said, is, is one of the most common symptoms um, reported by patients that I see in my practice. Um, it's funny, my, my, one of my last patients today actually came in with heel pain. Um, it, it's just something I see so commonly. Um, the literature really reports a, a high incidence of patients complaining of heel pain. Uh, this little uh, stat here at 15% uh, of adult patient foot complaints are heel pain um, is probably a little underestimated that that actually comes from an article that was in 2011 and and I bet it's a lot higher than that um, at this point plantar fasciitis is definitely the most common cause of heel pain um, and again here's a quote at over a, or excuse me around 2 million cases of uh, plantar fasciitis are reported a year and that quote as well is from 2011 so I bet that it's much higher um, than that in in today's world um, Achilles tendon disorders pain within the Achilles tendon and pathology related to the Achilles tendon um, does trail close behind plantar fasciitis um, when you look at reports of or within the literature of um, common causes of heel pain um, and the two really accompany each other because they have a very close anatomic relationship i like this picture here on this slide because it really shows you how the achilles tendon kind of comes down here in the back of the heel and wraps around and it helps contribute to that plantar fascia at the bottom of the heel and we'll talk a little bit about um, that throughout this lecture, but um, I do really like that this slide shows that. And some, some more background for, for you guys, um, some common predisposing um, factors to developing heel pain um, are changes in your shoe gear and activities. Um, heel pain can be brought about by wearing ill-fitting shoes, uh, by suddenly changing your shoes or your activities. Um, wearing high heels definitely can contribute to heel pain. This is a good picture here because really you can see um, how when you're wearing a heel, how your heel itself is actually elevated and um, that can contributes to a lot of issues, especially with the Achilles tendon. Um, other predisposing factors are your foot type. Um, some patients have very flat feet, some patients have very high arches, and, and that can in turn cause more pressure um, and, and cause pain at the heel. Obesity is a significant um, predisposing factor to developing pain in the heel. The heel is our, our you know, main weight-bearing surface um, when, when our foot strikes the ground. And so when you're obese, you, you're definitely putting more tension on your joints. Um, this is a stat that is somewhat impressive at seeing that 90% of women with plantar fasciitis also also have obesity. Um, the study I mentioned here um, has 40% of men, but I, I feel that what, with, with what I see, pardon me, um, it's probably a little higher than that. Um, other predisposing factors are diabetes, um, arthritis disorders, and of course trauma can, can cause heel pain. Um, in your diagnosing or in my diagnosing of heel pain, um, the initial assessment with the patient is, is really important, and that's important for, for diagnosing any disorder, um, but your initial assessment and with that, the question of the location of your pain is, is very significant. Um, most of the time, the pain is at the, the bottom of the heel, and that's related to plantar fasciitis, and then pain in the back of the heel tends to be more related to the Achilles tendon. Um, you can also have pain on the side of the heel, but for today's lecture, um, I'm really going to focus on the plantar fascia and the Achilles tendon. Um, over here, this picture is a, a good picture too, um, just showing the, the plantar fascia here and that Achilles tendon and some of the, the things I'll be talking about today, like plantar fasciitis and then something I'll talk about called Haglund's deformity. 
Um, so, uh, you know, here I have uh, with that first question or one of the first questions, what, where is your pain? What's the location of your pain? So once a patient indicates, you know, I have pain at the plantar part of my heel, at the bottom of my heel, um, my next question and, and really with where your pain is anywhere is going to be, you know, what type of pain is it? And that can be difficult for patients to describe. Um, if you've had pain for a long time, it can start to become difficult to, to really um, differentiate where it's coming from and, and to be able to describe the type of pain. But typically, um, you know, if somebody is reporting a burning pain, a tingling sensation, something that's shooting upward or downward into the foot, it's typically more of a nerve related issue. Um, if somebody is, is complaining of a sharp or, or achy pain, um, the timing of that pain can really help with the diagnosis. Because if you have pain with your first step, so say you're, you're in a seated position for a long time, you're in the car driving, or, you know, you get out of bed in the morning and you take that first step and that's when you feel your pain, that's a really good clinical clue for, for us as, as doctors um, to, to help us navigate what your diagnosis is. Um, if you're having pain with prolonged standing and walking, that also starts to kind of narrow down the possibilities. Um, these are not hard, fast rules by any means, but they're just tools that help us get to the bottom of what's causing your pain. Um, I did also just want to note that that pain with the first step is very, very classic of plantar fasciitis, but also of Achilles tendon disorders. And part of that is because when we're seated or, or when we're sleeping, our, our tendons, our ligaments, our tissues tend to relax and, and shrink up, if you will. And then when you go and you take that first step, if you have any inflammation, if you have any, any issues going on, it's going to really pull and it's going to initiate pain. Um, for patients that have pain at the posterior aspect of the heel or the back of the heel, um, further kind of digging into where the pain is can help differentiate the different issues that um, accompany Achilles tendon disorders. Um, insertional pain. Insertional pain means right where the tendon inserts on the back of the heel. And I'll have some other pictures throughout this um, lecture that kind of show you where the, where the tendon inserts. But the tendon comes down and inserts on the really bottom back of the heel there. So insertional pain. Um, um, can really be the just the bottom back part of the heel. It can be the, the whole heel itself. Um, and then there's also something that's called mid-substance pain. Mid-substance pain is, is like it sounds, it's mid and middle in the substance of the tendon itself. So it might, might not be uh, right on the bone. It might be right above the bone um, along your tendon there. And that's typically um, Achilles tendonitis, Achilles tendon issues directly. When you have pain that's really surrounding and is on the outside of the heel um, and really on the outside right above the heel on the lateral aspect, which is the outside part of the heel itself, um, that tends to accompany a, a disorder called Hadlin's deformity, um, which can come with something called bursitis, um, but it may present without bursitis. And again, I just want to make sure I, I say that these are not hard, fast rules. These are just clinical clues and things that help lead us down um, the path of, of the diagnosis. Uh, other important things for, for leading to the diagnosis are imaging studies. Um, the, the first line image that we typically get is a, a plain radiograph, an x-ray. That's something that um, most offices have. You can get an x-ray and it's important because you can really see the bony structures of the foot and the ankle. Um, you're able to rule out different things like fractures and bone lesions and, and, and joint disorders. Um, but x-rays, you know, they don't really show us the soft tissue. And, and what I'm talking about today is, is more of a, a soft tissue disorder. The bone is involved, but if you know you needed to to get a further understanding of a patient's disorder, if a patient isn't responding to some initial treatments, then sometimes um, some advanced imaging studies are necessary, um, and that's something like an MRI. Um, patients are, or excuse me, not all patients are able to get an MRI. Um, so sometimes to to assess the soft tissue, um, other imaging studies are used, such as an ultrasound. Um, on the the right down here. This is just a demonstration of an MRI. Um, and, and MRIs, you know, they give you so much detail and they, they can really give you that 3D picture of not just the bones, but, but the soft tissue. And the Achilles tendon is right down here and you can see it wraps down in, in inserts. And really, if you're able to zoom in, you can see that kind of dark line continues under and you have your plantar, plantar fascia right here. Um, and just before passing there, I, I should note too that I'll, I'll show this x-ray, I believe in another slide, but this little arrow is pointing to a heel spur there and um, spurring is a, a bony disorder. So you certainly can see that on an x-ray as well.
some treatment. Um, treatment for the, the two main disorders I'm talking about today being plantar fasciitis and um, Achilles related issues, um, regardless of which that is, um, the treatment typically um, is, is the same. Um, there's a nice little picture here. It's, a, it's somewhat of a, a cyclic picture here, um, but this is a really good way of demonstrating um, how I address these issues. Um, patients come in with, with pain, um, severe pain or long-standing pain, um, pain that can really affect your daily life. Um, and so the, the initial thing I want to address is, is treating that pain. The pain is typically caused by some sort of inflammation. Um, so first of all, um, we want to address the pain by decreasing the inflammation. But when you decrease the inflammation and you, you treat patients with things like injections, oral medications, um, the pain can go away. But if you're not getting rid of the true cause of the pain, which is some sort of deforming force going on, the inflammation will end up returning, the pain will return, and this cycle kind of continues there. When you have pain, you also end up creating deforming forces on your foot and your ankle because you walk differently, and then you create more inflammation and this cycle just somewhat continues there. Um, regardless of, you know, the, the etiology, like I said here, whether it's the plantar fascia, whether it's the, the calf muscle or the Achilles tendon, um, treatment should always be geared at conservative measures first. Um, in my profession, there are some things that you just can't really get around. Surgery is required. Uh, a fracture, for example, you know, you got to fix it. But for most um, of the, the disorders that I see, especially um, heel pain related, there are conservative measures out there that um, help, I would say, upward of nine percent of patients um, get better with some of the conservative measures I'll talk about here. So your initial um, conservative measures I, I just said was uh, decreasing um, the pain. So pain management, um, which is geared at decreasing inflammation. Um, once a patient is comfortable enough or their pain is improving, um, then you can really address the deforming forces. Um, the main deforming force um, in, in these disorders tends to be some sort of tightness, some sort of tendon um, imbalance. And, and I'll mention that here in a little bit. Um, so these are just some, some of the standard uh, conservative measures that we take, and this is for both Achilles tendon issues and for plantar fascial issues. So um, orthotics, orthoses, um, not, not necessarily a full orthotic that um, fits in your shoe. Um, there are other orthoses out there, such as heel lifts, heel cups, but just some sort of um, insert or orthotic to take some pressure off of your foot and changes in your shoes. Um, obviously, if you're somebody that has to wear um, certain shoes for work, um, you know, certain dress shoes are super narrow, or if you're in a, in a profession where um, you feel you, you need to wear heels and different things like that, it can be tough to treat some of this stuff because changes in your shoes is really important for taking tension off of off of the feet and the ankle and for resolving um, the issues I'm talking about here. Anti-inflammatories, um, there's there's two real options there. There's the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which are, are medications like um, Advil, um, Motrin, aspirin, um, and then there's steroids. Um, the steroids are, are somewhat of a more potent anti-inflammatory, but not every person can have steroids steroids and steroids aren't always indicated. Um, a first line treatment is certainly something over the counter like Advil or Motrin. Um, I, I should say too though that if you have pain in the bottom of your heel or the back of the heel and it's been going on a while, um, sometimes just taking an Advil isn't going to be enough to, to really knock out the inflammation. If you've had some pain that's going on for a while, that's that's been brewing for a while, sometimes you need something stronger or you need to take that medication on a regular basis for a certain period of time. Um, and I have here oral and injectable steroids. So if anybody uh, has plantar fasciitis or does any, has done any research on plantar fasciitis, um, you'll probably see that um, injections at the bottom of the heel are pretty common. It, it really is a first line treatment in addressing plantar fasciitis because you're delivering a potent anti-inflammatory medication right to the source of the issue, um, the plantar fascia. Um, however, and unfortunately, when you have an Achilles tendon issue, an issue in the real back of the heel there, and any, anything going on with that tendon, you typically cannot inject. And I really want to emphasize that because um, it, there are people that I've heard that, that have had injections at their Achilles tendon. And that's, that's dangerous territory because um, when you inject into the Achilles tendon, you, you run the risk 
risk of rupturing that tendon. Um, there are, however, some rare cases where an injection is necessary, um, and that is something that should always be performed with an ultrasound guiding you so that um, the practitioner can really see the anatomy and see where they're injecting that fluid. Um, there should never be an injection along the Achilles tendon um, without that, that visualization with an ultrasound there. Um, and uh, some of the rare um, cases that that, that would um, encompass are in um, elderly patients or patients that can't have surgery. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily a, a first choice option, but when you're going through these conservative measures and that patient can't have surgery, sometimes that is an option. Uh, initial conservative measures here are hot and cold therapy. Um, it, Cold can certainly be an anti-inflammatory. Typically, ice is something that can really help decrease inflammation in, in early issues, in acute issues. Um, after time has gone on, the ice isn't necessarily decreasing swelling or decreasing, um, decreasing inflammation. However, um, there's a picture here that I'm glad I was able to find where um, this is like one of those little paper cups and um, you can fill it with water and freeze it and kind of tear off the bottom or the top of it and really create this, this little um, held hand, uh, handheld, pardon me, ice massage um, device and taking ice and massaging it into somewhere, whether that's along the tendon or along the bottom of the heel, um, it not only can help with some inflammation, um, it numbs the skin, it, it can feel good if you've had a lot of pain, but in massaging, you're actually stretching um, tendons and, and the fascia at the bottom of the foot there, um, and you can help distribute inflammation um, within a certain area. Uh, heat is something that I always recommend to patients that um, if they use, they follow with ice because heat is very soothing. It tends to feel good. Um, we all know, you know, when you take a hot bath or touch hot water, your skin gets bright red and that's because heat dilates blood vessels. It is important in some healing processes because when you have a chronic issue going on, sometimes it, it's helpful to use some heat and draw some, some blood to that area to help clear out inflammation. However, if you just used heat, um, you run the risk of having more inflammation. Um, it doesn't necessarily um, worsen the issue, but it can start to complicate some things and then it can be concerning because patients are worried now that they have swelling. So whenever you use heat, I always tell patients to follow with cold. It doesn't have to be an ice massage. It could just be an ice bag, but to always follow with cold. Um, and other conservative uh, measures are really probably the most important, especially with Achilles tendon and actual issues, is physical therapy. Stretching is key. It is so important, and I'll keep emphasizing that. Um, but physical therapy and having a, a real comprehensive program um, that is geared towards really stretching the entire calf and Achilles and plantar fascial complex is so important. And I'll, I'll talk about that here as well. Um, more on, on the physical therapy here. So um, like I just said, it's an essential, essential treatment um, in, in really stretching out that tendon and stretching out the, the plantar fascia. The pathology really tends to be related to some um, musculotendo imbalance um, and where something is tight somewhere and then it's creating this deforming force, this pressure, this pulling in another area. So stretching is just so important. Um, the calf muscle itself, a lot of people don't realize their calf muscle, it doesn't just start back of the lower leg. It actually comes from one muscle that's above the knee and one muscle that come, is below the knee. Um, and they, they combine together and they form the Achilles tendon. Um, so a lot of patients I've seen, you know, they'll say, you know, doc, I've been stretching, I've been stretching, stretching, and I have them show me how they're stretching and they're not doing stretches with both the knee straight and bent. And so therefore you can have some residual tightness. And so that's very important. Um, I also just wanted to say that with everything that, you know, going on with COVID, I, I find that there are a lot of patients that are really hesitant to, to come in and especially, you know, start a formal physical therapy program. And I, it's understandable. I personally believe that it's important to um, create a treatment plan that is really um, structured towards a patient's needs and goals. And not everybody can come into formal physical therapy. So I think it's absolutely okay to start out with a home therapy regimen for, for most patients. But I just wanted to say that having actual formal physical therapy with a trained therapist can 
really help because there are a lot of modalities that they use that we don't have at home. And sometimes, you know, you can't fully stretch yourself at home. Sometimes it really is important to have the help from somebody else and a trained therapist, um, you know, any physical therapist really um, has seen plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis, and they likely treat it all the time because it is just so common. So they have different modalities such as ultrasound, massage, they can do the hot and the cold therapy. And then there's this technique that's called Graston technique. Um, it's a technique where um, there is a it's a it's a patented technique. It's it's using a special tool and it's it's used to almost irritate the tissue and stimulate the tissue to um, resorb any in inflammatory tissue, to stimulate healing, to stretch tissue. And so that is a technique that um, is certainly indicated in any Achilles or plantar fascial issue. And a physical therapist can certainly help with that. On the side here too, I just have samples of some stretches here. It's a good towel stretch. This is a good picture because you can see the knee is completely straight here and that really stretches that full construct there. And then just some other, you know, exercises here. This um, frozen can roll, that's a that's somewhat of the ice massage I just mentioned. A really good um, tool with plantar fasciitis because it, it's easy to roll something on the bottom of the heel is to freeze a water bottle or a can and really roll your foot along it. Um, on the Achilles tendon, it's harder to roll your leg. So a, a massage with your hand is a little more helpful. Um, plantar fasciitis. So I mentioned that plantar fasciitis is, is the most common cause of heel pain. That's reported in the literature, and it's something that I see very, very often. Um, just a little bit of background on the plantar fascia itself. The, the plantar fascia, it's a, a fibrous structure. It helps hold our arch up, the, the inside of your foot, the instep there. It helps hold up what's called the medial longitudinal arch. Um, the structure itself, it's a fibrous structure. It's not a muscle. Because of that, it doesn't have uh, the best blood supply. It doesn't have its, its own blood supply like a, a muscle and a tendon do, um, which um, lends to certain issues with it, with certain chronic um, degenerative changes that can happen that you don't necessarily, necessarily see, pardon me, with a, a muscle itself. So the plantar fascia, uh, it consists of three bands um, that it stretches from the bottom of the heel. And you can really see here, so this is the inside of our foot. This is the, the arch, the instep. Most of the plantar fascia comes off of that, that inside part here, which is called the medial part of the, the bottom of the heel. Um, and it's, it consists of three bands. It starts back at the bottom of the foot. It carries forward and inserts on the ball of our feet there. Um, what it does is it serves as a shock absorber when we're walking. It, it helps absorb the load. Um, because our foot is a, a dynamic structure, when we walk on uneven surfaces like the beach or, you know, if you're, you're hiking or you walk on an area that's uneven, your, your body adapts to that because the joints of the foot loosen up and allow you to, to step on those surfaces. And then the plantar fascia, it's a, it's a cushion shock absorber. Um, uh, predisposing factors can lead to chronic uh, pressure on that fascia and, um, you know, the predisposing factors that I mentioned before, um, changes in your shoes, your foot type, obesity, um, and what ends up happening is you get some, some inflammation and then we walk because we all have to and every day you get up and you keep going and you're just constantly putting pressure on that area and over time you can get these microscopic tears within the fascia um, and what happens when, when you get these tears is that our body um, goes in and it tries to repair it and, and it creates this inflammatory process overall. So our body is trying to help us by, by sending more blood flow there, sending all these different cells there. Um, but in essence, it creates inflammation in that area. Over time, you can start to get calcium deposits um, and you can start to build up a spur off of, off of where the, the plantar fascia is, is attaching to the bone there. Um, and over time, if, if this is an issue that goes on for for a while, you can actually get full thickness tearing within the plantar fascia itself. It can rupture, it can spontaneous, spontaneously, pardon me, rupture. And so uh, treating disorders of the Achilles tendon, um, I, I've mentioned a couple times here that the Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia are very intimately connected. Um, the, the Achilles tendon, um, it comes from, I said two muscles, but it actually um, comes from typically three muscles. There's, there's another muscle here, the plantaris, um, and it can be absent in a 7% of the population. So I don't want to say it's not important, but, um, you know, typically it's two main muscles. Um, the gastrocnemius muscle, which isn't shown in this picture, 
picture comes from above the knee here and then you have what's called your soleus muscle the the muscles um, can come down together and then they create one combined tendon that attaches to the back of the knee here um, because the the muscles uh, one of the muscles starts from above the knee there it helps the knee flex if you think about when you're walking um, and um, you're you're kind of doing that heel to toe when you're pushing off with the front of your foot your calf muscle fires your knee bends your ankle joint with the flexes meaning your, your heel goes up and it helps pull the heel up there um, some of those fibers I, I've said um, continue forward to help make the plantar fascia the um, the the tendon structure itself where it inserts on the bone and you can't really see it in this picture here but right in front of it there's a, a cushioned um, sack of tissue there called a bursa and then between the tendon and the skin itself there's a cushion um, that's also uh, a bursa um, over time when you have chronic issues with the Achilles tendon or when you have any inflammation around the Achilles tendon the bursa itself the cushion sac there starts to become inflamed and you can get something called bursitis. Um, so the, the three things I'm, I'm going to talk about here today, because there are there are an array of Achilles tendon disorders, and really for the sake of time, um, I just wanted to cover the, the main ones here. So tendonitis. Um, tendonitis is inflammation in the tendon. Tendonitis indicates an acute process. Um, tendinosis, you might hear or see, indicates a, a more chronic um, issue here. So inflammation of the tendon, it's usually caused by some sort of overuse or, you know, some, some sort of deforming force. Um, something is tight somewhere, something is off somewhere, um, and it leads to, just like I said with the plantar fascia, inflammation, um, then you get micro tearing, you get calcium deposits, and you can um, get a spur that forms. This is a good picture to show you those cushion sacs there. So the tendon wraps down here, really inserts at that heel bone, and you have this one cushion sac there, and you have one here. So if you have any inflammation within that tendon, and even from shoes rubbing and different disorders, you get inflammation in these Universal tissues here. Um, there's a, the, a deformity that I, I said I'd tell you about called Haglund's disorder. Um, there's a, a phrase that accompanies it called the pump bump because um, a lot of women um, tend to have this and, and they say it's from wearing pumps or if you remember that picture I showed you at the beginning of this lecture when you're in that, that high heel shoe your heel is lifted up and over time the tendon gets really tight so when you come out of the heels you have pulling at that tendon um, and you can start to develop Achilles tendon dish. Uh, disorders. Haglund's disorder itself is different than a heel spur. Um, and this part gets a little complicated and it gets confusing um, if you were to try to research Achilles tendon disorders or, or causes of pain in the back of the heel. Um, but a Haglund's disorder is if you look at the, the heel bone here, the heel bone itself has something called a pitch to it. And in a Haglund's disorder, there's just a, a prominence within at the tip of the, the back top of the um, bone here. And you can see that here, the Haglund's, it's kind of pointed up here. And when you have a Haglund's, um, the, the bursal sacs here um, can easily become inflamed um, and, and you can get swelling, you can get an actual bump on the back of your heel. That's very classic with a Haglund's. Um, you can, it can be red, um, hot to the touch, um, and just putting shoes um, in that area, the, the rubbing in that area is extremely painful. Um, this is typically seen in patients that are younger um, and not, not pediatric or children, um, but younger to middle age patients. And that's more because it can be related to anatomy. Um, it's something that uh, you can somewhat be inclined to get because you, the way you were born, your genetics, um, your foot type, the, your heel position, you know, that's something that tends to present in, in middle age to younger patients, but you can see this in, in patients of any age. Um, the, the last thing I'll mention is this retrocalcosome. Um, and that is different from a Haglund's disorder. That more of a tendinopathy, that is something that um, results from a long-standing um, issue within the Achilles tendon. Um, tendinopathy is, is degenerative changes within the tendon itself, um, and exostosis is, is bony formation within the Achilles tendon. And um, I can't zoom in here, but um, you can see this kind of little white fleck here and this really like building up of a spur in the back of the heel there, and that's calcification within the Achilles tendon. And then there's also spurring um, off of the bone itself. Um, this is usually seen in older patients, but again, it can be seen in, in younger patients as well. The reason it, it's seen in older patients is only because it's it typically is comes about um, because of long-standing issues. Um, you have chronic tendonitis, calcification, like I mentioned, 
you have a heel spur that forms and then you get bursitis because that spur right there rubs on this bursal sac right there and that becomes very inflamed. You can get a protrusion back here in the back. Um, with the haglands, I, I mentioned early on um, when you when somebody says I have pain in the back of my heel in the posterior aspect, when you're trying to differentiate, is it you know an exostosis? Is it just kind of your, your standard heels for here or is it a deformity of the bone itself, a, a haglands? With haglands, you tend to get pain more like right above above where the tendon inserts. You tend to get a bump a little bit above it, not towards the real bottom of your heel there, but really right above it. And then on the lateral, which is the outside aspect of the heel, really right there, kind of between your ankle. If you felt that bone on the outside part of your ankle, between that and that Achilles tendon is, is where patients can get some soreness there. So surgical intervention, this is, this is a question I get asked really often to spur or not to spur, I, I jokingly say, um, is removing the spur necessary? Um, there is a lot of controversy in the literature about that. Um, it, it depends, ultimately. So if you look at this picture here, this is the plantar fascia at the bottom of the heel. Well, this is where it would be if you're looking at an MRI, but here on the x-ray, this is where the plantar fascia is. It, it comes off the heel bone right here and carries forward to help hold up our arch to the bottoms of the, of the toes there, the ball of the foot. So you can see a spur right here here, it's parallel to the weight bearing surface. You're not walking on a sharp spike. Um, and the old school of thought really was that the spur was the cause of the pain. Over time, it was found that the spur is not the cause of the pain, especially in plantar fasciitis. The spur is an indication that something is tight, uh, that ligament structure is tight on the bottom of the foot, that there could be some little micro tears and your body went to try to repair it and fill it in with this calcium deposit. And really that traction off the bottom of the bone there, pardon me, um, you start to develop this spur. Um, so the old school thought again was with plantar fasciitis, the spur had to come out. And we've really learned that that's not necessary. In the back, of the heel. The spur is not something you're obviously not walking and putting pressure like you're walking on a spike. The spur is not necessarily something that has to be removed either. But if the spur is large enough and you really can even start to feel it through the skin, sometimes it has to come out because you know you, you can't wear shoes and you need to wear shoes obviously for, for most of, of things we do in life here. Um, but sh wearing shoes is important in protecting our feet and going to work and doing exercises. And um, if you have this big bony protrusion in the back of your heel, even with some conservative measures, um, it, it might not, you know, go away because the bone is an issue. And in those cases, um, the spur may have to be resected. So um, treating plantar fasciitis specifically here. So plantar fasciitis, I, I sometimes tell patients if, if it were me and you know I had to pick plantar fasciitis or Achilles tendonitis, I'd pick Achilles, or excuse me, I'd pick plantar fasciitis, sorry, not Achilles tendonitis because plantar fasciitis overall um, can be a little bit easier to treat because you can inject it. You can give that anti-inflammatory right to the bottom of the heel there. You can't do that with the Achilles tendon. So you can't always get that instant relief with the Achilles tendon like you can with the plantar fascia. The other um, positive, if there is any positive in having plantar fasciitis, is that if you did require surgery, which I do want to say a very, very low percentage of patients need surgery with plantar fasciitis, but if you do need to go on um, to have surgery, there are some um, minimally invasive um, procedures that are done. The old school um, thought with plantar fasciitis, um, like I mentioned, was that the spur had to come out. So an open surgery is required. That's You can't get the spur out unless you open it up. And just like it sounds when you do an open surgery, it's a bigger incision. Um, this is actually um, a picture demonstrating where it's demonstrating some anatomical um, landmarks there. We make measurements to know uh, a more precise location of, of where to enter the foot um, with an endoscopic uh, surgery here. But ultimately, um, because that plantar fascia comes mostly off of the medial heel, that is um, the most common place that patients develop plantar fasciitis. With an open surgery, you have a, a medial incision. So you have an incision here. Um, it's bigger than with an endoscopic procedure. Um, so you, you have a larger incision, can be a larger heel time, can be a larger scar. Um, and, and so that, those are really the, the pitfalls there. And um, when you have a, a large incision, especially um, in the foot um, and the ankle, um, you really have to make sure patients aren't putting weight down at first. And that, that's really my rule. Um, some people will allow patients to weight bear immediately. But for me, when you have sutures in, in the foot or ankle 
after any surgery there. Um, for the first two weeks while the soft tissue is healing, I don't have patients put weight down because um, of the effects of gravity. When you when you stand up, blood rushes down there. Um, if you have swelling, um, that certainly um, will um, put tension on your sutures. It can take longer um, for um, your incision to heal and, and things of that nature. So. Ultimately, I just want to indicate that if you have an open surgery, there tends to be a longer period of non-weight bearing or getting back to your normal activities. Um, with endoscopic surgery, endoscopic surgery is, is a scopic surgery, so it's using a camera. Um, there are different systems out there, um, but it is considered a minimally invasive um, procedure because um, it's done through small stab incisions. And there are um, there's a system where you put two portals, so you need an incision on the inside of the heel on the outside of the heel and um, the um, the company that I use I'm um, called right medical um, they have a, a technique where it's just one portal and and that is that is what I use so you have a small incision that goes about right in this area um, you you make your measurements um, so you know your anatomy and your landmarks there and um, you make a small incision you put the camera in um, and you can see the plantar fascia um, these um, the instruments that you use to release the ligament. Um, they have measuring tools on them so you know that you're not um, releasing too much of the fascia um, and you you ultimately go in and that ligament that's that ligament structure that fiber structure that's tight you release it and and that releases the pain. Um, the other difference too with plantar fascia surgery versus Achilles surgery and just the plantar fascia um, in general is that you know if by releasing the plantar fascia um, you're some people worry like you know don't I need that um, ultimately if you leave the bulk of the plantar fascia intact you don't need the entire medial band there so you release that that generated tight you know ligament and that in turn um, alleviates the pain um, with the Achilles tendon you can't just release the tendon you need that tendon that tendon is important for pushing off and, and walking it's necessary so you can't just release it so that's another big difference with with plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. Um, with uh, plantar fascial surgery, um, open surgeries, um, and for certain patients, just depending on how diffuse the pain is, if all of the bands are involved, um, it is uh, sometimes better to release more of the plantar fascia or all of the plantar fascia. Um, the, the benefit in that open surgery is that you can resect the spur if that's something that was needed or necessary, which it's typically not, but if needed, you can. Um, you can release the entire fascia and then if there's any accompanying nerve entrapment, which I'm not really talking about here today, um, but if there's a nerve that's irritated or entrapped, if you open it, you can release it. Versus with an endoscopic surgery, you're really just releasing the fascia itself. You can't resect a spur. You can't, um, you know, release a nerve there. With plantar um, fascial endoscopic surgery, um, there is also the benefit that you're returning to your activities typically sooner. Um, immediate weight bearing is is typically essential, and that's in in both. Once your incision heals, it's important to walk because you're releasing a, a tight um, ligament structure, and if you don't walk and you're casted, it can just scar right back down tight and you can have reoccurrence. Um, when you have a large incision, I certainly won't let patients walk right away until those stitches come out. But with the endoscopic procedure, because it is such a small incision, patients are typically weight bearing immediately. So with the Achilles tendon here, um, unfortunately, like I said, there's no real endoscopic way of addressing it um, because you can't just release the tendon itself. And the Achilles tendon being as important as it is in, in our gait and walking and pushing off um, and just the, it really drives the foot and ankle in general. Um, you know, you don't want to release it. You don't want to risk putting a camera in and, and not being able to fully see your tendon. You want the, the reassurance that you repaired that tendon and you really address the issue. So an open procedure is typically required. And again, that's because of the way that that functions, the anatomy, and also because with Achilles tendon issues, there's typically multiple things going on. It's, it's not just the tendon. Sometimes you have that inflamed um, cushion bursal sac tissue, and that needs to be removed. Um, if you have what's called the Haviland's deformity, you need to remodel and resect the back of the heel. So you can address multiple things in an open procedure. Um, in both the Haviland's and the, the retrocalcaneal exostosis surgery, um, the tendon itself does have to be um, split. And, and this is the typical way this procedure is done, is that you actually have to partially detach the tendon. Um, and so you, you make an incision um, 
um, within the tendon itself to be able to get to the to the haglands, the that that pointed part of the heel, to be able to get to the inflamed tissue um, and to be able to remove the heel spur. Um, in doing that, when you make an incision right through the tendon itself, you can also clean up the tendon. So if there's any calcium deposits in, in it, any inflamed tissue, you can remove it and really repair the tendon itself. Um, you can also um, reattach the tendon in a higher position. So typically the tendon comes down and it, it really fans out and it broadly inserts around the bottom of the heel here. Um, if part of the issue is that you have an overly tight tendon and um, or you have a pitch issue here on the, the back of the heel, you can advance the tendon. So when you reattach these fibers, you can actually reattach them with an anchor a little bit higher up on the heel. And that in turn um, takes some of the tension off the tendon itself. So you can do a lot of things with an open procedure. Um, so yeah, the benefits here, you address multiple causes. The pitfalls here is that in the back of the heel, and this also lends to why Achilles tendon issues become chronic and why Achilles um, tendon issues result in um, these calcium depositions and the, these chronic issues, um, is because the tendon itself has a, has a poor blood supply. Muscles have a, a great blood supply and they help give blood supplies to tendons there. But if you have something that doesn't have a good blood supply and then you have some sort of issue in it, your body can take a long time to heal that area. So because the tendon itself has an avascular area to it, a, an area without much blood um, flow to it, it can take longer to heal. Also, the skin in that area um, it can take a longer time to heal because of a um, decrease in, in vascularity in those areas. Um, the other really tough thing about Achilles tendon disorders, whether it's something being treated conservatively versus surgically, is that anything that touches the back of the heel is going to bother it. So of course, you know, being in shoes or trying to put an orthotic in, the back of the shoe rubs that area. When you're in a walking boot, um, you know, the back of the boot rubs that area. So you have to be, um, you know, you have to keep that in mind. Um, and so if you have an incision in the back of the heel and that person's in a boot, that it can take longer to heal the incision because of the extra pressure um, in the back of the, the heel there. So um, these, I, I just wanted to mention these and, and I will have lots of time here uh, when I finish up to, to answer any questions and talk about um, any, any questions you guys might have here. But treatment of both the plantar fascia and Achilles tendon um, issues um, can be addressed with um, some other non-invasive or minimally invasive modalities here. So there are things that are called percutaneous procedures. Um, these are, are percutaneous, it's through the skin, um, done through either stab incisions or really tiny incisions. Um, they are, they're quick procedures, so there's minimal to no incision as I mentioned. Um, recovery after a, a percutaneous procedure or these, these procedures I have mentioned here um, typically entails weight-bearing right away, but in a protected fashion, so in a walking boot. And then after about two weeks, um, you're getting these patients back into their shoes and over a two to four week period, because after surgery, whether it's minimally invasive surgery or it's open, you know, thorough surgery, it's going to be a recovery process, just getting back to, to your normal life there. So I'd say over about a two to four week period, you're progressing back to your normal life here. Um, the other benefit of, of these types of procedures is that most insurances do cover them. Um, the pitfalls in these procedures is that, um, you know, they're, they might not help. Um, if you have a long-standing issue, um, like I've mentioned, uh, you might need to do an open procedure to, to fully address the issue. Um, you know, they're, they're not indicated for all types of um, Achilles tendon and plantar fascial pathology, um, but they can be a, you know, a first-line treatment. Some patients, um, because of their, their lifestyle, their work, um, you know, they have to care for their family or, or an array of, ish, array of reasons, pardon me, they, they can't have surgery. They can't have a, a big surgery that's going to require them to be non-weight bearing for a long period of time. So these procedures are definitely an option. Um, these procedures, um, which are 10X um, and 10Jet, and I encourage patients to, to look them up, look at videos, um, look at their websites. These are ultrasound guided um, ways of debriding inflamed tissue and stimulating your body to repair tissue. Um, you can see in this picture here, this is just from 10X. There's a probe device and you have an ultrasound. So you're 
you're looking live action at where exactly you're delivering that probe and whether you're doing 10x or 10 jet um, you're you're either um, using the probe to to pulse that area through ultrasound frequencies and really break up at a microscopic level um, scar tissue inflamed tissue um, calcium deposits and then there's a suction device at the same time which is removing that tissue um, with um, there's also using the saline itself um, through a a pulsed um, delivery system and the pressure of that that saline being pulsed can also break up inflamed tissue it is not aggressive in the sense that it's a huge big needle that you're poking around in um, uh, there is always the risk when you have a, a an, an area like the plantar fascia or the Achilles tendon where there's already degenerative changes where there's already inflammation and these structures are weakened that if you do anything that's going to probe that area that you could get ruptures um, but it is pretty low risk and and these are pretty safe techniques um, and again they're they're you know considered minimally invasive non-invasive and, and insurance does typically cover them so outside of you know actual surgical procedures where you're um, where you're using a probe and, and making those stab incisions there are um, other um, options out there the unfortunate thing with these types of treatments is that insurance doesn't usually pay for them. Um, so there are in injectables, biologics um, that are out there, and that's using your body's own cells or donated tissue um, to go in and stimulate repair, to decrease inflammation. Um, typically, um, when patients undergo these um, types of injections and treatments, which are um, uh, PRP, platelet-rich plasma, and then injections um, using amniotic fluid, amniotic tissues, and stem cells, um, typically, just like with the procedures I mentioned, there is a period of immobilization in a walking boot um, for that patient um, and then a progression back to activities. There is research out there that does show benefits to um, having these types of procedures done. Um, Platelet-rich plasma, PRP, is, is something that that's pretty common at this point. Um, a lot of people have heard of it, but it's using your own blood. You, your own blood is drawn from you and it's spun down to leave behind um, growth factors and anti-inflammatory cells within the, the plasma. Um, that then is injected around um, your, your tendon. You can see down here, this is the Achilles tendon. Again, I recommend ultrasound so you can really see where you're injecting. Um, and then it can also be done at the bottom of the plantar fascia. Um, there is argument out there that these types of injections may be just stimulating the tissue by injecting with the needle um, and then putting a patient in a boot is what helps um, ultimately. Um, but there's also studies and, and things out there that show that it does actually actively decrease inflammation. Um, there are physicians within our group that do um, PRP, um, and I would be happy to talk to anybody further about that. I do think it is an excellent, excellent modality, and it's also really good to um, uh, use as an adjunct. So you don't necessarily have to use these alone, but you could certainly use this accompanied with one of the other procedures I mentioned, um, and even one of the other uh, more minimally invasive procedures, such as a TENJET procedure. You can do your TENJET procedure, and you can also so add on some platelet-rich plasma or um, some sort of donor um, tissue, which would be amniotic, um, amniotic tissue or amniotic fluid that, that you inject in that area or stem cells. And um, you can actually, and, and doctors within our group can actually um, harvest these from you. Um, they can um, do what's called a bone marrow aspirate and take your own marrow, which has um, stem cells and, and growth factors and anti-inflammatory properties to it and inject it in these areas where you have this chronic degeneration and, and pain going on. Um, again, that stuff that can be used as an adjunct. It can be used with an open surgery, with a closed surgery, um, just to, to give the kind of, I guess I want to say double whammy, you know, you're doing the surgery itself um, and then you're adding on these anti-inflammatory, um, you know, injections. Um, those, again, are things I'd be happy to talk to talk to anybody about if they had questions. And again, there are physicians within our group that do um, harvest that. And so it is something that can be done within our, our practice entirely. That was really my the bulk of, of my presentation here. Uh, some take home points and, and a few summary points here. Um, a thorough history and physical is key. That's for anything really. That's for any doctor's visit that you have or really getting to the bottom of any issue you have. A thorough history and physical is so important. And, and that's on the doctor, but it's also on the patient. It's really important just to, to give all the facts, um, you know, location of the pain. Some of this seems a little bit like common sense, like of course I'll tell the doctor, but sometimes we forget things, you know, and it's important to, to try to try to pinpoint your pain. I always recommend to patients, try to pay attention to what time of day you notice it. Try to pay attention to what makes it better 
or what makes it worse because those are all key things that can help in your treatment plan and in your diagnosis. So location of pain, type of pain, how long has it been going on? Have you ever had any trauma? That could be in childhood. Um, things that happen in childhood could certainly rear their head later in life. So, so all those things are important to talk about. Have you ever had surgery? Um, have you ever had issue on the issues, pardon me, on the other leg? Um, a lot of people don't realize when you've undergone surgery on one leg, whether say you had a knee replacement or a hip replacement on the left side, and then later on, even if it's months or years later, you end up with these issues on the right side, it could be because you had a period of time where you had to favor that right side. So all the details are so important to share. Um, what I, I emphasized here, I think a lot was that the Achilles tendon and um, plantar fascia, they really um, accompany each other. The, they have such a closely connected anatomy. And so their pathology really accompanies each other. Sometimes patients come in and it starts out as a plantar fascial issue. And then the bottom of the heel feels better, but the back of the heel starts bothering them because those complexes are so um, connected. Um, that little cycle I, I showed there um, of, of ways to treat these issues, address your pain. And we do that by decreasing the inflammation. And then you want to make it so that it doesn't come back. Um, when you get rid of the pain, say it's through a pain medication, um, an anti-inflammatory, Tylenol um, being a pain medication, anti-inflammatory like Advil, um, you know, that might work for a little while. But if you don't address the core of the issue, what caused the issue in the first place, it may end up just coming right back. Um, so you really have to make sure, one, we get you comfortable enough that these tricks and, and tips and, and conservative measures will actually have an effect. Um, conservative measures should always be conserved first, and that's with most everything. Um, understanding the, the connection there I have here, stretch, 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 that is just so important. Um, I, uh, I always jokingly um, tell a story about my, my dad who had a really chronic case of, of plantar fasciitis. Um, he ended up getting an injection in his heel and it helped some, he, he hated the injection, it, it helped some, but he didn't wanna get any more injections. And I would tell him every day, to stretch. Stretching is so important and he was so stubborn and he wouldn't stretch. And then one day he gave me a call and he said, I cured myself. And I was very excited to know how. And he said he really started paying attention to the way he was walking. Um, and so when he was walking and um, he works in a, in a profession where he, he wears work boots um, and in pretty good supportive shoes. But when he was walking, I um, he didn't realize he wasn't really walking in that heel to toe way. So he was really diligent about making sure when he took that step, he, he was going heel to toe when he was walking. And ultimately when you do that, if you try it, um, you'll feel that that's stretching, it's stretching your Achilles tendon. And so so by him really just just paying attention to how he was walking, that, that cured his case. So I, I always tell him, I give, I give him a shout out on a pretty regular basis to tell patients about that, that that is something that, you know, you might try it, it might get rid of your pain, it might not, but, but hey, it, it's worth trying because a lot of us, when we're walking, we shuffle our feet a little bit, or you don't think about that. You know, you, you don't think about the way that you're walking, but walking heel to toe can help you stretch while you're walking. Um, consistency is essential. Um, with plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendon issues, they're such naggy issues um, and they're frustrating. You know, I, I also like to say that the, the feet are the roots of the tree. Um, I think the feet are very underappreciated and nobody really, you know, cares about the feet until something happens, but the feet are so important. You need your feet to walk, to work, um, to, to live really. So, um, you know, some of the things that might work when you have an issue in say the upper extremity or, you know, the head, the neck, you know, they're not necessarily going to work in the foot and the ankle because of weight bearing. Uh, all of our weight hits that heel every day. You know, if you, if you could take two weeks off work and just lay there and keep your foot up, a lot of these issues would go away, but that's not feasible for anybody. So you really have to be consistent with your stretching um, and, um, you know, really understanding your pathology and, and really making sure you um, follow up with your doctor and, and just stick to your treatment plan. Um, other little key points here, just to summarize too, um, is that, you know, surgery is not typically required, especially with plantar fasciitis, but sometimes it is, like I said, with Achilles tendon issues. And if surgery is required, some people are really scared to talk about surgery or don't want surgery, and that's understandable. But I just want patients to know that if surgery is required, it doesn't necessarily mean there's a long recovery time. There are minimally invasive options out there. There are non-invasive options out there. Um, and, uh, and ultimately too, I, I think that there's 
there's two sides of the spectrum and, and then there's always a middle ground. There's patients that, you know, are, don't want surgery. There's patients that are frustrated and they just want surgery. And, um, you know, there's the saying, like, once you have surgery, you don't go back. And it's true. Once you do surgery and you alter a structure, it, it's been altered. So you really want to exhaust your conservative measures there. And it's very important for people to know that, you know, surgery is not a cure-all. Surgery is not perfect. Even with these minimally invasive procedures, even with these non-invasive procedures, there, there can be issues and complications, you know, so it's always important to really try and exhaust your conservative measures first. Um, and then treatment, whether it's conservative or surgical, um, you know, often requires a lifestyle change. Um, that's something that's also important to, to stress um, to patients. And I try to stress to patients that, you know, some people just, they don't want to do physical therapy. Um, you know, it, it's a frustrating process. You know, they don't want to go in to have formal physical therapy, but I try to always let patients know that, you know, even if you have surgery, you likely are going to need some sort of therapy because when you have surgery, even if you are in a walking boot for, you know, two weeks, you're always going to have this period where you're progressing back to activities. Um, and then if you have a, a procedure where you're not non wavering for a longer period of time, then you're definitely going to require some sort of therapy because when you're not using that extremity in the, the way that it should be used, other things get weak. And um, ultimately, you can start to have issues on the other side. You can start to have knee issues, hip issues because everything's so connected. Um, even with surgery, um, oftentimes patients still require orthotics um, and some sort of you know, change in their shoe and, and an insert in their shoe. And then just a little last point here is don't wait. Um, you know, I, I find that I'm seeing a lot of people, especially with what's going on with the pandemic, that you know, maybe couldn't come in or, or were worried to come in and, and you know, they, they let a lot of things wait. Um, and, you know, the, the earlier you can intervene with this stuff, the better, because these first line treatments of, you know, simple things, icing, taking anti-inflammatories, they're much more effective if, if you're um, treating these issues early on. Um, and, you know, one last little thing I'd say here too, is that um, I am seeing a lot of people that are coming in because of the pandemic, um, you know, maybe people were off of work, maybe people People had more time at home and they're they're either you know they there was a period where they weren't doing a lot and then they're getting back to work or um, maybe they were at home and they started some sort of new at home exercise or something like that. And then ultimately that created some sort of deforming force or pressure on their foot. And, and now they're, they're thinking, you know, I'm just trying to get back to work or start an exercise routine. But ultimately, um, if there's anything off, you know, you're going to get these developing issues. So um, that is it for me. And um, this is the, the Q&A portion here. So I will answer some questions. And I already have some here. Um, the first question I have here is, can kids get plantar fasciitis? And um, that's a really good question. Um, there is a disorder in kids that is, is likened to plantar fasciitis. It's called Seaver's disease. And in kids, kids don't typically develop the, the true plantar fasciitis. They can, um, but they don't typically develop that true plantar fasciitis, um, like I'm mentioning here. Um, but in kids, the, the heel bone itself um, has a growth plate. And you can imagine, if you, if you remember those pictures that I showed you, um, where the, the tendon, that big tendon comes down and inserts on the back of the heel and then it wraps under and you have your plantar fascia there, there's a growth plate right there. So if that tendon is tight, if there's something off, whether, you know, it, again, it was like a change in activity, a change in shoes, something like that, or wearing ill-fitting shoes that put tension on the, the ligament, the plantar fascia, the actual growth plate gets inflamed. Um, and that can present as um, pain with the first step in the morning, um, you know, pain with shoes, rubbing in shoes. Um, and the treatment is very similar. Um, it's not surgical, but it's First of all, we gotta rest it. We gotta um, we gotta decrease the the pain and, and get rid of any inflammation that's in there. And then it's stretching. Um, with kids too, I'll, I'll just add that um, you know there's this the way of explaining it that sometimes when kids are going through growth spurts and the the bones are growing and, and more or part of me quicker than the tissue can keep up with. So it's so things just intrinsically get really tight. Um, and then that can lead towards plantar fasciitis. Um, Seaver's disease, which is S-E-V-E-R, um, is something that I would encourage um, anybody who has a kid with heel pain to look up. 
um, and it's really all about stretching. Um, and then if you have a, a kid or your kid is, is complaining of heel pain, um, I also encourage you to just, just say, hey, why don't you bend over and let me see if you can touch your toes. And I almost guarantee you that they're super tight in their calf and in the back of their knee and their hamstrings um, because of the, the things that I mentioned. So stretching is really important. Um, when patients, and whether this is an adult or a child, are in acute pain, when it's really that tender and, and painful, um, the initial treatment with the Achilles tendon especially is taking tension off of it. So putting a heel cup in their shoe, putting a cushion in their shoe. But you have to be careful with that because once the pain is decreased, stretching is so important. If you add anything to the shoe to take tension off of the tendon, like a lift or a cup, sometimes that actually just keeps the tendon tight because the, the heel isn't fully touching the ground. It's important until they're comfortable and their pain is better. And then throughout, they're just stretching, stretching, stretching. So there's that one. Um, another question, um, does rolling calves with a roller help with plantar fasciitis? Um, that does um, help with plantar fasciitis um, because ultimately um, a very high percentage of cases of plantar fasciitis are related to the calf being tight. And a lot of people get um, confused or frustrated, like it's my heel that's bothering me. Um, you know, why am I working so hard on my calf? My calf never hurts, but that calf is that driving force for that push off and that pressure on that heel. So yeah, rolling the calves um, with a roller can certainly help with plantar fasciitis, um, whether it's on a foam roller or, um, you know, you can certainly do ice rolls and different things like that. Um, where do you do the surgeries? Um, are they outpatient? Um, so the surgeries themselves are, are typically, um, for me, I, I typically work out of our surgery center, um, which is Mercer County Surgery Center, and it's at our Lawrenceville location. Um, pretty much all of these surgeries can be performed there if there's some sort of insurance issue um, or other factors, um, patient factors, um, then sometimes I'll, um, I'll perform these operations in a hospital setting. Um, I go to uh, Princeton Hospital here in, in in, um, or pardon me, Penn uh, Hospital here in Princeton, um, which is right near our office. I go to um, St. Mary's, which we have an office uh, within the building attached to the hospital there. I also go to Robert Wood Johnson. Um, I also um, operate out of the virtuous system, which is down south as well. Um, another question here, um, can the plantar fasciitis lead to coldness in the leg? Um, this person mentioned that they use insoles for their plantar fasciitis and they feel an internal coldness in the leg. Um, on the outside, everything seems okay. Nerve conduction study did not show any abnormality. I, um, you know, they mentioned some medications that they're taking here um, in the legs. Um, you know, it's a, somewhat of a dynamic question to answer. Um, it's tough to say a coldness in the leg. Um, Anytime, um, you know, a patient relates to me a feeling of coolness or coldness in the leg, um, I immediately want to make sure that that patient's blood flow is okay. Um, you know, that's something that if, if this patient here or this person here hasn't had an, an assessment um, by a vascular doctor, I would encourage that. Um, certainly with plantar fasciitis, it can lead to um, feelings that travel up into the leg itself. Um, you know, if there was some sort of nerve conduction um, study that was done, and that's looking at the nerves, which can also cause some symptoms like that, and that was normal, um, I would encourage, um, you know, a patient, and I would definitely start leading down the road of making sure the blood uh, supply is okay. Um, so I hope that answers that one there. And then here, do you, uh, do you do the percutaneous procedures in the office? Um, no, that is not something that's typically performed in the office. It is typically, it's, it's an outpatient. Um, Every procedure I talked about today is, isn't done in an outpatient setting. Um, most procedures are done under a sedation. With Achilles tendon, um, you know, open procedures, it's somewhat done or sometimes done under um, general anesthesia. But the percutaneous procedures at this point are done at our surgery center. In our, in one of our offices here in the Princeton office where I'm at today, um, we do have a procedure suite here. So, you know, there could be the possibility of doing it within our procedure suite, but traditionally it, it is done in the office. Um, and then another question here is, um, I mentioned using a frozen water bottle as a rule for the plantar fasciitis. When is it appropriate to use heat, um, uh, like booties that can be warmed and worn, or does heat make it worse? So um, 
for heat, um, you can certainly use heat um, beginning right when you're starting to feel pain. However, it is really important when you do have, um, you know, when you are using heat, pardon me, that you use ice afterwards. Um, so you, you know, I always recommend to patients if you want to do like a, uh, take a hot bath, you know, and, and massage, you know, if you want to put a heated compress, if you want to use booties or, you know, one of the, the heating devices you can put in the microwave, you can certainly heat um, that area. What it does is it's, it draws blood flow um, when you use heat. That's why, you know, our capillaries dilate, your skin gets red um, when you, when you touch hot, hot water and, and hot surfaces. Um, so dilating blood flow, um, increasing blood flow to an area where you have inflammation can actually help. It certainly can. It feels good. It's soothing. Um, but it is important after you use heat to then use ice. Um, the ice then, it's not that it stops the blood flow, but it, it somewhat closes it down um, and, and it can numb the skin and it can help decrease inflammation as well. It's tough to say whether heat makes it worse. In traditional plantar fasciitis, heat does not typically make get worse. Um, but um, ice, I, I always tell patients, ice is always okay. Heat um, is definitely okay, but always follow with ice afterwards. And then um, this last question I have here um, is that um, this person is already using orthotics. How often would you recommend having um, them replaced or checked to see if it is defective? That is a really also um, a variable question. Um, and it somewhat depends on the type of orthotic, the material that they were made out of. But I would say a, probably a good conservative answer is that, you know, three years um, is probably a good amount of time in, regardless of the type of orthotic. Um, it should last you a good three years um, and to have them checked and, and to see if they're effective. Um, if you end up, you know, for some reason having surgery somewhere, not even in the feet, if it's the knee or the hip or, or something like that, sometimes it's important to then go have um, your orthotics checked because ultimately your gait might have changed. And so I would recommend um, having your orthotics checked at that time. Um, some insurance companies will approve a pair of orthotics a year. Um, however, for me, and just depending on the patient, if a patient, if I mold a patient for orthotics and they want another pair, um, the company that I use holds on to those molds. And if there hasn't been any drastic change for that patient, if they like their orthotics, orthotics, they fit well, um, then there's not necessarily a reason to remold a patient or, or recast them for an orthotic either. We can always just use their mold. Um, if your orthotics, if the top of it looks like it's starting to wear away, um, definitely um, go in and, and have them checked out. Um, you know, if just, you know, you can take them out of the shoes and kind of stand on them and even, you know, see in the mirror if it seems like they're not really giving you support, you can have them checked out as well. Um, and I hope that answers your question. Um, some of the some of the materials we use, like the some of the materials I use when I prescribe orthotics are like a carbon fiber plating, which is within it itself. It's not the padding, but it's within it in that lasts a very long time. So sometimes patients come in and they don't even need a new orthotic. They need what's called a, it to be um, refurbished. And I, I send it off and um, the lab will, will put, repeat pad it. Or even with the orthotics you have, again, depending on the structure of the orthotic or the material it's made of, sometimes you don't need a brand new orthotic. The lab itself can adjust it for you. So I hope that that, that answers that question. And um, I think that was it for all of the questions. So um, thank you everybody for tuning in and all those um, that weren't able to attend um, live that are watching this lecture. Um, I personally commend patients for taking, or anybody really for taking the time um, to, to, to learn. And also for patients, I, I encourage all patients to, to take your care into your own hands to a certain extent. And so I applaud those who, who take the time to seek out information. I think it's really important. So thank you guys very much. That's it for me. Thank you, Dr. Collins. We really appreciate you joining us. Such great information. Um, as mentioned earlier, I'm just going to launch a poll. If you have time, I'll give you just a few minutes or a minute or so just to fill out the two questions. It does really help us gauge what kind of information you're looking to learn about. Um, and then we move forward with your suggestions. So we really do appreciate that. So there you go. So there are just two questions there. Again, if you have any questions that Dr. Collins was not able to answer or that you think of after this presentation, let me go ahead and go to the next slide, email programs at mbortho.com and either myself or Dr. Collins are happy to get back to you with any questions you may have. If you're looking to schedule an appointment, 
Um, there's the information there. You can go to our website at www.mbortho.com or you can call the number listed there. And lastly, if you do not receive our newsletters, um, these are the ways that you find out about all of these different fabulous webinars. Go ahead and email programs at mbortho.com as well and I'd be happy to add you to our mailing list. So thank you so much for your time today. We look forward to seeing you soon.